The following program is an MLWRadio.com production. Today's episode of What Happened When? Monday is brought to you by our friends at FullBrickHouse.com. If you're ready to own a house for only $500 down, FullBrickHouse.com is the place for you. They'll even help you cover your moving costs. It sounds too good to be true, but now you can own a full brick house, a brand new home, for less than what you're paying in current rent. Or maybe even better than that, credit scores in the 500s can be approved. And as always, with a new home, of course, you're getting a bumper-to-bumper warranty. If something goes wrong, you're covered. And if you're worried about your lease, FullBrickHouse.com can even help you buy out your current lease. And of course, the very best thing about FullBrickHouse.com is you're going to be in a brand new home. New is just better. Not only do you get a warranty, you get to pick everything out. You can make this dream a reality and own your very own full brick house for only $500 down, even with less than perfect credit at fullbrickhouse.com. Welcome to WHW Monday, Tony Schiavone and Conrad Thompson talking about the great years of world championship wrestling, the NWA and Jim Crockett promotions. And now, let's go to the ring, and here's your co-host, hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to What Happened When? The Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Tony Schiavone, right here on the MLW Radio Network. Tony, what's going on, man? How are you? Hey, hey, Conrad, and hello, Slapdicks. You know, the, the term master of ceremonies, that kind of reminds me of the circus. Uh, I guess maybe this is a circus, isn't it? What well, we do for a living. It is. And last week you spent an awful lot of time talking about feeding a peanut to a glistening baby arm. I'm hoping hmm. that we can pivot away from some Space Mountain talk. Do you think we can string together a whole show with no Space Mountain talk as a follow-up to last week's episode? I think we can, uh, although it's not going to be completely erased from our minds. Uh, it can be erased from our tongues, so to speak. Mm, well, you know, there was a saying once, uh, you can't be first, but you can be next. And uh, from what I understand, it's back open for business these days if you're in the market for such. I, I understand that is as well. <laughs> what was your feedback on last week's show, man? Uh, I had a lot of feedback about the most feedback I got was basically about what you just talked about, the <laughs> listening babies arm. <laughs> but also got a lot of feedback about, and I didn't realize this, but as I'm uh, uh, going to help uh, the old lady uh, known as Lois Rules uh, to uh, put Apple TV on at our house, you had said, I've never called play-by-play play on a divorce before. And that got a lot of response as well. We're not getting to divorce. She has nowhere else to go, okay? No no other person, no other man would have that woman. Uh, it's just me, and I'm with her. Arn Anderson said, uh, after we had our twins back in 1987, he said, you are married to that woman, as he said in his Rome voice, for life. And I am married for life, so don't never worry about a divorce on our end. I think that actually might be a T-shirt, married for life. As opposed to the NWO, it could just be like Lois stamped on the shirt. And it could just say for life underneath, maybe old school NWO style. That'd be good. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of fun designs over at ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash WHW. And uh, Tony, you've been trying to catch up on some calls. Well, what's been the big seller these days over at ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash WHW? Uh, Klondike Bill or Bill's Glass Bottom Boat Tours, still a big one. Lowest Rules picking up a little bit of steam, but... Uh, Damn, I am good. It's still a big one. You know what else is big? As you know, we were talking, kind of talking about it last week in a way. Flair hit it first is awfully big as well, off and running. Uh, and I broke Wahoo's leg has helped out a great deal too. So there's a lot of a lot of them in there that are that are hot. Uh, and we certainly do appreciate. Remember, every penny uh, of the t-shirt sales until the 24th of March goes to my daughter's wedding. Thank you very much. So let's uh, let's keep this tradition of miserable Shivani marriages going and uh, support it at ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash WHW. In case you weren't aware, whenever you pick up a shirt, eventually Tony Shivani will call you 
And that's just right. something I felt like suckers got to know because that is a phenomenal t-shirt in the top reel right now. Suckers got to know. Uh, my two favorite t-shirts though, for sure, are Easy Way, Hard Way, You Pick, and Low Key Big Hog. There was nothing low key about last week's episode. But maybe the most famous bit on the in the history of the show at this point has got to be Tommy Young. And it is there for your enjoyment over at ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash WHW. These shirts are hard to beat. And we've got that hard to beat. The one a slap dick. Uh, my wife picked this out. Evil, mean, and nasty. Old commentary ninja. Hot tag. Pasta still rules. I'm a Tom Zink guy. All this stuff right now. ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash whw and don't forget to follow us on twitter he is tony shivani 24 i am at hey hey it's conrad and we are at whw monday and let's get into it tony it's time right. to talk about our most requested topic ever wouldn't you agree i think so because there are a number of fans that i i've, I've seen on twitter on social media that say you know what i don't i don't remember you being in the wwe or back then the wwf uh, and there are some fans who say, you know what? I thought you did a great job at SummerSlam 89 and the Royal Rumble of 1990. And and there's me uh, saying many times that it was probably the single uh, best year I've had in the business. Well, and uh, so it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot to talk about, a lot behind the scenes. And so I'm looking forward to talking about it today. I know a lot of you are listening right now and you thought, Hey, I didn't think you were ever going to cover this. Well, I'll let Tony pick what we were going to talk about. I had a bunch of poll options picked out. He just freestyled. We're talking about this instead, but we're going back to the poll this week. So stay tuned at the end of this week's episode in just a few minutes, we're going to run through the topics. There's only one place to vote though. And that's on Twitter at WHW Monday, but let's get to the topic at hand, man. When Tony went North, we've talked about this a lot, uh, last week and, I guess almost every episode so far, you join the NWA in late 83. You stay with that company until sometime in 1989. And eventually you kind of see the writings on the wall and, and you make what you feel like is a better choice. And you leave the NWA for the world wrestling federation. What were the circumstances that led to that departure, Tony? A number of circumstances. Uh, first of all, uh, Jim heard, uh, took over WCW, took over the NWA. It was being sold to Turner Broadcasting from Crockett Promotions. I have mentioned many times on this show uh, how much I do not like Turner Broadcasting and did not like the way they ran wrestling. I didn't like the way they they did things. Uh, Jim Hurd had offered me a six-figure contract uh, to work for Turner Broadcasting. Uh, and he told me during the meeting that I would be getting the same amount of money as Jim Ross. Uh, I was told later by my friends at Jim Crockett Promotions that I would get be getting much less than Jim Ross. Wow. Now, I didn't mind that. I did not mind that. What I did mind was being lied to. Uh, and, of course, what the people at Crockett Promotions told me may have not been true. We may have been offered the same amount of money. Who specifically told you you were going to be getting the same amount of money? Jim Hurd did. And who specifically told you that you would not? Uh, it was a guy named Emerson Lawson who was in production. Uh, and he said, uh, so you're going to go with Turner? I said, yeah, they've offered me uh, six figures. And they offered me the same amount of money as JR. And he said, I don't think that's the, the case. And he knew it was a very small front office, right? Right. Uh, and he said, he's getting offered this amount of money. And I'm not going to say what I was offered compared to what he was offered. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, that, that's true. So that, again, not being concerned. I, I'm only concerned about what I'm making. I, I'm not concerned about what everybody else makes. But I am concerned when I'm lied to. Sure. And that started the trend of me thinking this was not so good. So let me uh, ask you this. When you were told the amount of money and, and then it was in the six figures when you got the second report, did you believe that the number would still be six figures and the, the lie in the situation would be your pay relative to JR's or had they misled you on both hands in that it was not only the, the same or less than JR, but not six figures as well. 
No, I believed him about six figures. Okay. Look, and I was, I was working. I had been working in minor league baseball, Conrad, and the most I made in one year in minor league baseball was fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I was going to say that is a labor of love most of the time. Yeah, right. Uh, I did get extra money by working wrestling. I got extra talent fees by working wrestling. Still, when I moved from baseball to wrestling, I still got my baseball salary of fifteen thousand dollars. I think it may have ticked up by that time to seventeen five or something like that. And then I got talent fees by doing world championship wrestling, by going out and doing whatever. Uh, I got talent fees, so it ended up making a decent living. But when I'm brought in and offered six figures, uh, it completely blew me away. And you know, I'm I'm not that far really out of college, so. I mean, I, and I've said the story, I mentioned the story during JR's uh, show that we did with him, is that I firmly believe that JR went in there with us, meeting with me, Jack Pidrick, and Jim Hurd, and ended up selling those two on both of us. And I think Jim Ross, by his ability to talk, his ability to sell, he's one of the great salesmen of all time, that's why he's maybe the greatest wrestling announcer of all time, his ability to sell was enabled me to make six figures. So I credit him with that. And the fact that he did most of the talking, you know what I can understand. they probably think, you know, he's probably worth a little bit more money than Shivani who sat here during the meeting to shut his mouth and listen to JR talk. He probably deserved more money than I did. So that's fine. But the fact that well, I was told that it was different started the, the, the trend downhill for me feeling about Turner. And of course just didn't get a good feeling about Jim Hurd. So the close to that time, and I can't remember exactly, it may have been a week later or it may have been a couple of days later, I got a call from J.J. Dillon. And J.J. said, I'm leaving. I'm going to work for Vince. And I asked Vince, is there anybody working for WC or working for uh, Turner Jim Crockett Promotions that you would like to talk to? And he said, yes, Tony Schiavone. So J.J. said, if you will let Vince if you'll talk to Vince, I'll have him call you. And I said, okay. And Vince called me. Uh, and it, it's odd, oddly enough, I, w- I went over to Magnum TA's house. And of course this was after Magnum had been hurt and Magnum had a treadmill where he was, you know, trying to get back and, and trying to rehab. And I was on the treadmill at his house and we were watching primetime wrestling on Monday night. And it was the episode where uh, Bobby Heenan, rest in peace, brought out the Brooklyn Brawler to beat up the Red Rooster. I don't know if you remember that or not. Yeah. Yeah. That was that night on Monday night, and I got back home, and the phone rang, and it was J.J. Dillon. So that was, I I can almost pinpoint the exact day, whenever that aired on primetime, which was obviously a Monday, to when that happened. And J.J. said, you want to talk to Vince? I said, sure, and Vince ended up calling me the next day. And that's how it all started. So let's talk about that conversation. When Vince calls, is he at this point trying to set up a tryout or an interview, or is he going straight to, we're going to, we want this guy. We're going to make an offer. He offered me money right there. Well, there you go. And when he made the offer, how was it relative to your Jim Crockett offer? It was, uh, it was about, I would say 40% more. Wow. So there you go. That's a big deal. Plus he offered me money up front for move expenses uh, taking care of my house payment until I got a place to live. Uh, and, uh, he offered me some money up front. So, uh, it was a pretty good deal. So uh, l- l- let's talk about that for a minute, because when you get this offer, it-, it feels like, you know, it's kind of a whirlwind. There's a lot going on, you know, Crockett's are out now. WCW's in Turner's taking over the pizza man's running the show and yeah. you-, you get the biggest money offer you've ever had, but you're still, kind of feeling a little bit like you've been lied to, but you've got this whole litter of children to take care of. Right. What's Lois thinking about all this? Is Lois just saying, hey, well, just, you know, let me know when to start packing? Or is Lois kind of nervous about, hey, we've got this gig here. You've been making good money. Now you're about to make even better money. Why are we uprooting the family? Or what does that sound like? Uh, She is thinking, let me know, and we'll start packing. Okay. And, and the reason she, she was like that is, Lois, you know, we have a lot of fun with her here, and, and she can be a miserable bitch, uh, but she's uh, pretty laid back, and uh, she also was a Army brat, so she's used to moving. There you she go. She was very young back then, so it was no big deal to her. Uh, so, yeah, whatever I wanted to do was fine with her, and uh, 
we were ready to go. So there is no real whining and dining, you know, story. We, we've all heard the famous Vince flies you up first class, picks you up in a limo, takes you out to the finest restaurant, gives you, you know, you and your wife show tickets, puts yeah. on the real song and dance. That's not really the case with you. No, he offered me money and I said, okay, uh, sold. So uh, do, at that point, how does the conversation end? Does he give you a start date? Does he say he's going to overnight you? paperwork what's the next step he said come up here and talk to us talk to me and pat uh and terry garvin at that time and i said okay he flies me up doesn't fly me first class flies me into LaGuardia. uh i'm not so sure if the a limousine picks me up but you know he has drivers and cars right a car picked me up uh, and uh, drove me to greenwich at his house and okay. we sat in his living room and talked uh, and I said to him, uh, or am I signing a contract? And he said, do you want a contract? I said, well, I've, I've never really had one. And he, I, I remember him saying specifically, we'll get you a contract if you want one, but do understand that contracts are only worth the paper they're printed on. And I said, all right, then I don't need one. Um, so that's how that went and, uh, blew me back home and, uh, Jim Hurd called me. Not so sure if he called me before I flew to Vince's house or afterwards. And Hurd says, heard you talking to Vince. Heard you want to go up North. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm pulling my offer to you then. I said, okay, thank you very much. And I hung up. And had I been the Tony Schiavone in 2017, I would have added, go fuck yourself into that conversation as well. Well, uh, at, at that uh, point, you didn't know, you know, how long her it's going to be here, how well you would like it up there. There's no sense in burning a bridge, right? Yeah, there's no sense burning a bridge, but he was, and I didn't burn a bridge, obviously. Uh, he was combative. Uh, that's the way he was, and I found out how combative he was when I went back. So uh, we were all set for me to go to the WWE. So let's talk about, because you just kind of went through a lot of stuff here. W when you're picked up, uh, they drive you at the from the airport straight to Vince's house? Yes. You know, lots of, of, of people listening to this have always been curious about this situation because we always hear that Vince would bring talent to the house a lot. Um, yeah. Tell us about Vince's house. Was it mm -hmm. uh, in a neighborhood? Did he live behind gates? Uh, did someone else answer the door? Did Vince answer the door? Carry us through your memories of, of visiting the McMahon home. Uh, from what I remember, and remember this is 1989, um, from what I remember, Greenwich is obviously a high, high rent district, as you know. Uh, a lot of big houses that set back from the road, and we went through a gate. Uh, I don't think it was I don't think it was manned by any guards or anything, but we drove through uh, a long drive and drove up to this very, very big brick house. A very, it, I mean, it was a mansion. There was no question. Uh, Vince didn't meet me at the door. The driver walked me in, and Vince was in his. Uh, and Pat Patterson and Terry Garvin were all there. Uh, and Vince was in his uh, den that was kind of sunken down from the main level of the floor. And I sat there and talked to him. And uh, so uh, that's kind of what I remember about it. And I got back in the, uh, the car and went back home. No first class, I mean, no first class ticket, no dinner, no whining, dining, me and Lois at all. And that's basically what it was, a meeting with him to get to know each other face-to-face. -face. So you, you didn't even spend the night? I did not. So you just flew up and flew back. So talk, talk to me about the meeting with Vince in the house. As Vince, you know, we hear different versions of this. Vince walks around his house uh, in, a, in a suit, and Vince walks around his house in workout clothes, and there's nothing in between. What well, yeah, was workout clothes. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's rumor and innuendo, and this is silly, but a lot of wrestlers probably just trying to rib Vince say that he has a portrait of himself in his den. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. No, I, mean, I think I would have remembered that. I mean, that seems like, you know, I want him to be like the, the dude in the old spice commercial, like shirtless and on horseback on the beach. I just right. think that would be phenomenal. Sure. Sure. It was a, it was a great meeting. It was a great day. And I, I, I felt so good about what I was getting ready to do. And, uh, it was a great meeting and, uh, 
I do remember during the meeting him saying this. He said, I want to take myself off television. I need to, uh, I don't know how he said it exactly, but I need to take myself off television and be more attentive to the day-to-day operation of what's going on. And I want you to replace me. You're going to be the person that replaces me. And I guess he and Jesse were doing superstars at that time. Right. And Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby were doing challenge. And I said, okay. He said, so that's basically what it was. And he said, and, and I told him the same thing that I, I had often told Jim Crockett and I had often told uh, Turner Broadcasting. And I said, you know, I want to do more than just announce. I want to come up here, be a part of the office. I want to work in production. I want to be a producer. He said, well, uh, he said, I know that we have a need for someone to be the producer of our home video cassettes, Coliseum videos. And he said, so I will, uh, have you work on that and you'll get to know Bruce Pritchard. You'll get to know Kevin Dunn. And I said, great, I'd love to do it. And, uh, that's how it all worked out. So, so that I was, was going to be an employee too, not just, you know, announcer that flew in from Atlanta or flew in from anywhere else to do TV. Would he have been receptive to that? Do you think, or, or was he clear right up front that he wanted you to move? No, he wanted me to move. I think. When, um, when you're having a discussion about moving, is there ever any sort of discussion as to where you're going to live? Does Vince say, listen, I need you to be X amount of minutes from the office, or is there just the expectation that live whatever you want, just be here by a certain time? I mean, most yeah. people listening to this have an expectation that they have to be at work at nine o'clock in the morning. I'm sure there's lots of independent contractors listening or salespeople who kind of set their own hours, but in a traditional office environment, you work from, you know, eight, eight AM to 5 PM or nine to six or whatever. Are you given any sort of direction in that regard? No, not really. And, and television production is different than a nine to five office hour. Sure. You have, you have different, uh, assignments. Like for instance, the first video cassette that I produced was Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And I had to meet with the people at Coliseum Video. I had to work with editors and pull footage, work with the librarian uh, pulling footage, and uh, had a deadline to where I had to have it out. Uh, And if that took me 9 to 5, or if it took me like 5 to 10, uh, so be it. I just had to get it done. Uh, Talking about Vince's house, is there anything else in particular you remember? Like, was there... I mean, if, when you just, if you were just wandering into the house for the first time and you didn't know what Vince did, would you know that he owned a professional wrestling company? Is there wrestling stuff around or is it very much just regular yeah. family home? Uh, in 1980, it was a regular rich family home. It may have changed since then. You say rich family home. You got yeah, it was a big house. I mean, it was, it was a giant, it's a giant, look, a, a modest house in Greenwich, is no joke. Nine is is a lot of money. So you can imagine how much this house costs. So freestyle uh, for me for a minute. Did you just go straight in the front door into the living room and out of there, or did you have any detours there anywhere? Anything else interesting that you remember at all about Vince's home you can share with us? No de- no details at all. Uh, I just walked in, walked into the den, which is kind of centrally located in the back of the house, right, and and then walked out. A lot. The reason I ask is a lot of wrestling fans have heard over the years that Vince would, you know, book TV out by the pool. And there's various skits and segments that we've all seen in wrestling, like Mr. Perfect playing pool that was shot in Vince's house. And okay. uh, one of the early Summer Slams, there's uh, a girl jumping into a pool. That's Stephanie jumping into the pool in the backyard. Things right. like that. Right. So. That's my weird fascination with his house. Did you ever visit uh, any of the Crockett homes? Did you ever go to Jim Crockett's house? I never went to Jim Crockett's house, but I went to Mama Crockett's house. Uh, Jim Crockett Sr.'s mother, or wife, uh, Jimmy, David, and Francis, and Jackie's mother, uh, during the years that I worked for Crockett Promotions, was still alive. And I went to her house many times for parties and, and things like that. But I... I never went to Jimmy's house. I went to Francis's house a couple of times because I worked more directly with her. Never went to David's house. Never went to Jackie's house. But uh, no. How would you compare Vince's home to Mama Crockett's? Mama Crockett's home was very, very nice. It was uh, Queens Road section of Charlotte, which is a very nice section. Absolutely. It was a unique house, and it had a tree growing in the middle of it. Really? 
Yes. I don't know if you ever heard that story. And uh, uh, we would have big Christmas parties there, and it was like a big oak tree that was in the middle of the house. Uh, and it was pretty unique. Uh, but it was nothing like Greenwich, Connecticut. Nothing like it. Man, a tree in the house. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. So l- let's talk about the terms of your first deal. You know, you mentioned you didn't get a contract. You mentioned they gave you moving expenses. It's just a handshake. Do you, do you work out a term? Are you saying nope. here's what it is per year and it just feels like it's indefinite? Yeah, I feel like I'm up there to stay. Okay. As a matter of fact, I told, I told uh, Vince, I said, I'm up here to stay. And, and I really thought I was. Uh, so, you know, again, keep in mind that we're talking about 1989. Uh, we're talking about, uh, what, eight years after I graduated from college? Right. And, right. and I'm making pretty good money for someone who just graduated from college eight years. Uh, so I, I'm fine with my life. And Lois and I go around and, and we look uh, at the, we spend a number of days in Connecticut on Vince's tab going around looking at houses. We went to Bethel, Connecticut. We went to uh, New Canaan. Uh, we went to all these different places. And I'm thinking, you know, I, man, I, I, we can't afford to live here. We can't afford to buy a house because the houses were four and $500,000. I had been living in a house in Charlotte that cost $89,000. Right. Now, a size house that was in a neighborhood that was what we consider safe, and was a big enough for a family. We had a dog, we had a cat, and we had five young kids. That was four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a house. So we quickly realized that we weren't going to be able to buy because they wanted ten percent down up front. Well, not just that. It's worth mentioning that in nineteen eighty nine, what month was that? Do you recall? Yeah, that was uh, February. Rates are like ten or eleven percent. Okay. Yeah. You know, so if you're borrowing, you know, four hundred thousand uh, yeah. dollars, even on a thirty-year loan, before any of your taxes and insurance, your monthly payments like thirty-eight hundred bucks a month. Yeah. So it's a considerable amount of money, especially if you're used to paying an eighty-nine thousand dollar mortgage. You know. Right. 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 So uh, we found a place to rent. Uh, it was pretty. It was a house remotely r- removed from everything. It was. It was in Wilton, Connecticut, just a little bit north of Norwalk, not too far of a drive from the office, down the Merritt Parkway. And uh, we ended up renting this house for $2,300 a month. Wow. Okay. And $2,300 a month rent in 1989 is serious. Yes, it is. Listen, I, my mortgage, and I've been, uh, li- we've lived in the same house since we moved back to Atlanta. Uh, my mortgage has never come close to that, my mortgage payment a month. Right. And you have a very nice home. Yeah, it's, well, before Lois moved in it, I think it was. Yeah, I mean, when you can get the dog hair out of the way and you can actually see it, it's pretty yeah. nice. Well, when, when she gets up off of watch, looking at her phone and starts to clean it, it, it looks pretty nice. Um, uh, I'm kidding. But uh, so, so anyway, so all of a sudden, and I'm excited about it, and now I'm thinking, man, this is going to be tough up here. Sure. And everything's, everything's tougher up there. I mean, gas is more up there. Groceries are more up there. It's just the cost of living is more in Connecticut. But there's a couple of things that that I thought was a bonus. Uh, well, number one, I was working for the, the WWF now. That was a bonus. And number two, we were close to New York City. And Lois and I love New York City. You love the shows. Love the Broadway shows. Love musicals. We've talked about that. We, we went many times. We got to go to musicals and Broadway shows. We had a great time. Uh, the problem was... Uh, to get somebody to babysit the kids uh, was ten bucks an hour. Uh, so if we would if we would take a train into the city to see a show, uh, you're talking about let's say five hours, you know, fifty bucks for babysitting, uh, and then you know, a couple hundred bucks. It was an expensive date. But but anyway, we love New York City, uh, and we love living. I love living up there. Uh, we had a was a real nice town. Real uh, Wilton was a real nice town. Uh, good health care, everything. Everything was good. So, what was the uh, what was the, the best part about living up there? Was being so close to New York. What was the worst part? The rent, the cost of living. Well, cost of living was the worst part. 
the best part about moving to Connecticut was, and I think this has to do with not only me uh, working for Vince and working for Titan Sports, but also working with the Coliseum Video guys and having to go in on the on the train to New York City. I think the best thing was I felt like I was in the big time now. And I was working within the number one market in the country, and it just felt big. That was the, the best thing about it. Uh, so once you move, when do you report to work? Are you up there for days or weeks before you actually report? How does that work once you're you're up there? If I, I recall this correctly, I reported near the end of February, mid part of February, and uh, the family didn't come up till April. Okay. So I was up there by myself for about a month and a half. And you, and, were, you were living uh, in the house by yourself or you were just in a hotel? I'm in a hotel. Okay. And put me up in the hotel. And uh, I got to hang out with Bruce Pritchard a lot and uh, <laughs> eat, uh, go out to lunch with Bruce, go out to dinner with Bruce, and uh, got to know Bruce really well. And, uh, and it was good because my family was removed. And I spent hours and hours and hours in the office, late at night in the office. I didn't have any reason to get back. Uh, about two weeks after I got up, about two weeks after I got up, John Michael, the oldest one of my twins, who's 29 now, aspirated a piece of plastic toy that had broken off into his lungs. Uh, and Lois called me. She said they had to take him into the emergency room and they had to do, <coughs> they had to go in and remove move this part out of his lungs. So I told Vince, Vince said, take off. He flew me up, flew me down to Atlanta to see John Michael. They had to go in and uh, this procedure, go into his lungs and pull out the piece of toy. Lung collapsed. He was in intensive care for a while. He pulled through, obviously. Uh, and I went back home. Uh, and there was no question based on that and no question based on the way he treated me that he was a guy that was going to look out for me and my family. No question. So you, least, felt, you felt much better about working for him than say Jim Hurd at that point. Oh, well, hell yeah. Absolutely. Talk, talk to me about your first day. You're saying the office, were you in the studio here or are you at Titan towers or is this before they purchased Titan towers? No, Titan. Towers, they had a place downtown, uh, Stanford. This is before Titan towers. I go into the office, uh, and I go through all the procedure of, of, you know, signing up for insurance and healthcare and HR and all that. And then I go over to, uh, 120 Hamilton, which is the production facility and told there's my office. I meet Kevin Dunn, uh, Kevin Dunn brings me in, brings a staff in, introduces me. And he said, normally, and this was kind of a thing they did back then. No, he said, normally with a new employee here, we make you sing. Hulk Hogan song, Real American, but I'm not going to make you do that. I said, okay, thanks. And uh, got to know that first day uh, Lord Alfred Hayes. I got to know uh, a guy who's still a very good friend and Tom Carlucci, who's the international producer. Uh, I got to know uh, all the editors and everybody. And I'm telling you, Conrad, it was a tremendous working environment. It was. I, uh, they they had a big place called edit one back then where Kevin Dunn worked. Uh, and that's where they shot. That's where they, uh, videotaped primetime wrestling, had an audio booth over on the right. Vince came in, said, welcome aboard. Uh, later that week, Hulk Hogan came in and came up and said, uh, I always wondered when you would arrive here. Uh, and, uh, got to know him and, uh, everything was great. That had to make you feel good to be welcomed by Hogan like that. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, the more I'm talking about this, the more I'm thinking, what a dumb fuck I was <laughs> to go back to WCW. But I think that's that's very well uh, that's very well been established by me on earlier podcast here. Um, if you're curious, you can actually kind of see the outside of this building here. You've talked about we've talked about it a lot. 120 Hamilton Avenue in Stamford, Connecticut. Is that where they had a lot of the Mean Gene and Sean Mooney, um, like, news updates and stuff with all the screens and all yes. the boards and all that in the background? Yes. They had 
They had a, a big studio as big as any television studio in New York City. Uh, and they had a, a master control room and three edit suites. And the master control room was just gigantic. And that was back during one-inch tapes. Right. Uh, and I remember someone came over from, I don't know, one of the television magazine shows to do something about wrestling. And I remember the producer walked in, and I was in the master control room. The producer walked in, looked around, and she said, all this for wrestling? Wow. It was impressive. It was, it was absolutely impressive. And I knew immediately, I knew immediately when I started working there, why Vince succeeded and why Vince would succeed because he put his money in the right places. He didn't run production on a shoestring. He had a big production budget. He ran it correctly. He put the money into people and equipment. They had they had an engineer. They had an engineer on call in the office there in an engineering 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day an engineer in the engineer department. So if something broke down while you were editing, he was on it right then. By the way, does that even exist in radio stations in 2017? No. Of course not. Of course not. D- describe, you know, or I guess can you, compare that studio setup and that production facility to the one that Jim Crockett was using? Jim Crockett really didn't have an edit suite. Now, we never heard of an edit suite at Jim Crockett Promotions. Everything that we did was live to tape. When we went out and taped a television show, we did it live to tape. So when we left the arena, like in Spartanburg, we had an entire television show. When we stopped taping at the TBS studios, we had an entire television show. And what the, would happen when we would go back and do the local promos in the backstage area or in back in the, which was a converted garage at Jim Crockett Promotions office, there was a guy named Wayne Daniel who would, who would load the tape for Charlotte. And we would do Charlotte uh, with the baby faces. Then he would have a tape loaded for Greensboro with the baby faces. And then he'd go back and do the heels. And then he would unrack the tapes, put it in the box, and ship it out, and it was gone. There was never any editing done at all. None. For Jim Crockett Promotions. Uh, where did you go on a daily basis? Were you in the main office downtown, or were you on Hamilton Avenue? You know, my office was on Hamilton Avenue. I... After going to that office the first time, I, I very rarely went there. I, I had a, a couple of ideas for, uh, for shows and things to do, uh, and I did go and meet with Vince a couple of times in his office. Uh, and uh, I do remember when the kids got there and my wife got there, I wanted to introduce all the kids to my family, and all the little kids, all five Shivani kids went right by Emily Feinberg's desk. She said, go on in. Walked in to see Vince, and we had the twins who were like a year and a half old. Uh, Matt, who was six, Laurie, who was five or four, and Chris, who was three. They all walked in like a bunch of little ducks. Wow. Uh, to meet Vince. Yeah. Talk to us about Vince's office. You know, I'm, get, I'm getting depressed here. There's a. Uh, well, hang, hang tight. Don't hang yourself to shit. <laughs> um, Vince's office is something that we've talked about or we've heard about a lot as wrestling fans. And these days, there's a giant skull from Tur- a Tyrannosaurus Rex on the wall with uh, like a panel of red tiles. And once upon a time, we saw his office on the Beyond the Mat movie with like this crazy white and black carpet. Um, he's got like this giant WWF sledgehammer, uh, a cast. From Andre the Giant, Andre's old Halliburton, uh, interesting stuff in his office that has kind of become legendary. What do you remember about Vince's office before it was in Titans Towers when it was downtown? It was just an office where you kind of walked in, and to the left was his desk, and there were a couple of chairs in front of his desk, and there was panoramic view or panoramic windows behind him and to the as I'm looking at him from his desk to the left and some places to sit over on the left was nothing, nothing like that. It was just a big office. Right. Uh, with a lot of windows. And That's in, all. in 1989, there's probably no computer or anything like that. It's just a phone and papers. 
I think that I think there was uh, there may have been a computer screen. I remember uh, I remember we had a computer, but it was like you know the old DOS system computers back then. Sure. So, um, it's just interesting to me to think about Vince McMahon running DOS. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> well, you you ran what the what they had at the day, right? What, what type of office? You know, I know we're doing a lot of comparing and contrasting, but what type of office did Jim Crockett keep by comparison? Uh, Jim had a big office too, but uh, again, uh, the you can't compare the two offices. Jim the Jim Crockett Promotions was this standalone building that was very modest, uh, and probably at one time I I don't know had a garage, and uh, when you walked in his office, his office was to the left, and he had the big big desk as well, but it wasn't as fancy. It wasn't near as fancy as as Vince. Um, where was your office located? I know you said it was on Hamilton Avenue. Who else had an office there at the time? Kevin Dunn was there. Kevin Dunn was there. Uh, Bruce Pritchard was there. Lord Alfred Hayes, a kid named Kevin Graniff, great kid. Um, there was, um, there were a couple of girls who worked in the office. One was M- Michelle Carlucci, who still works there. One was a girl named Ann. Uh, and Ann was kind of like my secretary. I had a PA. Alicia Murphy, who had an office. We, Alicia and I kind of sh- shared an office back then. Uh, and uh, there were a couple other producers that worked on things and had offices. Uh, but mine was kind of upstairs, right off from Bruce's. Is that where a lot of the television was written, you know, as far as storylines and such? Or do you no. think that, that it wasn't there? I, From what I understood... Television was always written at Vince's house, and I wasn't a part of writing TV. So, hypothetically, if if people in the studio there were trying to get their feel of mystery, romance, or sci-fi, they really needed Audible, did they not? Yeah, I think so. You know, when I when I think about it, we are in a we are in a time here, a Conrad, where uh, I think radio is going bye bye, and people listen to our podcast they listen to audible when they travel they listen to audible when they let's say they're on the train between cities or they're in a bus and look i travel with the baseball team this year i listen to audible a lot because it's uh it's the best the best audiobook performances unmatched selection and the most exclusive content you know i talked about this last time we were talking about audible that uh i'm a big sci-fi fan big star wars fan Star Trek. Also, I was a big X Files fan when it was on TV, uh, and I found out that X Files is on Audible. And here's what's great about X Files being on Audible: David Duchovny is the guy narrating it. How about that? That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you experience things like a hair raising on the back of your neck when they find something on X Files or they investigate something. Audible sci-fi performance is so powerful you can feel transported to another dimension even while sitting in traffic. And I know we do a lot of that. So you can start your 30-day trial and your first Audible book is absolutely free. Go to audible.com slash what happened when to learn more. That's audible.com slash what happened when. W-H-T. W-H-A-T. I can't even spell what. W-H-A-T. H-A-P-P-E-N-E-D when. W-H-E-N. And get your first book for free. That's Audible. And uh, you can get transported anywhere. If you're a big sci-fi fan like I am, you can. And also, I realize one of my favorite books is on Audible right now. What book is that? The Sub Art of Not Giving a F. Well, there you go. Start a free trial right now. Uh, your first book is free, man. It's a 30-day trial, and your first book is free. If you dig the show, why wouldn't you go get some free stuff? It's audible.com forward slash what happened when. Hey, everybody. It's Sean Mooney in the MLW Radio Event Center, and here's the latest. MLW's return is now just two weeks away, and we have breaking news. Fresh off the Mae Young Classic, Mia Yim will face Santana Garrett at MLW One Shot. Plus, MJF will lock up with Jimmy Yuta, fresh off the tour of Michinoku Pro. It's the most anticipated show of the year. Get your tickets and see MLW live in Orlando at Gilt Nightclub by going to MLW.com 
right now. Tickets start at just $15. And the world of MLW never stops. This week on MLWRadio.com, out now, what happened when with Tony Schiavone, who takes us back in time as he talks about the 16-time world heavyweight champion, the nature boy, Ric Flair. This week on the J.J. Dillon Show, J.J. and Rich get into the history of the NWA TV title and some of the champions that held it. J.J. shares stories working with the man whom he calls the greatest manager of all time, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Swing by Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling as they provide their comedic take on all things pro wrestling. This week, they gear up for No Mercy, who will win. MLW One Shot main eventer Shane Swerve Strickland stops by MLW Radio with MSL and Rich Bocchini to talk about his big match with Ricochet and more. Then goes south of the border with a stacked lucha talk this week as the gang talks about the 84th anniversary show of CMLL. And be sure to catch Prime Time with Hacksaw Jim Duggan and me, Sean Mooney, as we pay tribute to one of the greatest personalities in wrestling history, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Search Prime Time with Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Sean Mooney on iTunes, all other platforms, and of course, MLWRadio.com. And don't forget to get your tickets to MLW One Shot for Thursday night, October 5th in Orlando. This event is tracking to sell out, so head over to MLW.com right now so you don't miss out. Now it's time to get back to your MLW Radio podcast. Uh, Let's talk more about... Um, the, the studio here, because we've heard lots of rumor and innuendo that this is where Eric Bischoff did his tryout to be an announcer. Do you remember seeing this video or hearing about it? I've seen the video. I think the video is available. I think it's, um, is it on YouTube or somewhere yeah, now? You, or? you throw it in your I, Google machine and see it. How relieved yeah. are you that you didn't have to do something like that? What's that again? <laughs> how, just, how relieved are you that you didn't have to do something like that? Yeah, you know, I would have done it. I would have been glad to do it. I, uh, but it, it seemed to me by talking to Vince on the phone and uh, working and working in the front office there that I didn't need to do anything like that. It, it just kind of seemed that I was in. Now, I didn't, I didn't approach my job like that. I've never approached my job like that. But uh, uh, I never had to uh, do any sort of tryout with him. Uh, and maybe after I uh, got there and he realized he didn't really like my work, which I think is pretty well known, uh, then uh, then maybe he decided, well, we better get people to try out now. So, Where did you go on a daily basis? You're, you're in the office. Is there a certain time you're showing up? Who's kind of handing that down to you? Are you answering to Kevin Dunn at that point? No, I'm answering to Bruce, and I don't really go anywhere. Uh, I go out to lunch with Bruce uh, many, many times. I remember I learned what a tuna wedge was. Uh, we had tuna wedges a lot. We went out to lunch and uh, got to know the guys in the office and uh, got to know the guy. Anybody that knows me knows that I try to get to know everybody uh, from producers uh, to directors to people working work in the master control to people who work in shipping and delivery. I just like to get to know everybody uh, and get to try to be personal. And, and I got to be very friendly with a couple of people. And basically, I would work very late and go back to the hotel. Uh, and then when Lois and the kids arrived, I would work not as late and go home and be a dad. What specifically are you, are you working on usually at that point? You're trying to do voiceover work for matches. You're trying to lay out formats for the videotapes. Do you recall like what you're working on when you're there? First uh, videotape I worked on was Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Right. I remember taking a little demo of what I had been working on because I started out the Hacksaw Jim Duggan video with a little video music montage about Hacksaw Jim Duggan using Stars and Stripes Forever as the background. I took it to the people at Coliseum Video, and I remember uh, Howard at Coliseum Video saying, Oh, my God, we've never had anybody put this effort into our video cassettes. So that made me feel very good about it. Uh, And so I struck up a very good relationship with them. They were very happy with my work. I would have to do every month a video cassette. Uh, Either one that they had what they called rack video cassettes, which were the the inexpensive video cassettes, like the best of WrestleMania or the best of SummerSlam or the best. And then they had their monthly 
video cassettes. So I had basically a video cassette to do every month, and I had a video cassette to do right after all four pay per views. And that video cassette, after all pay, four pay per views, had to go out immediately. So that I was I was pretty busy. I, I had a I had an assignment uh, every month. So when you're talking about putting together this like demo of your work. I assume that you're not actually in the edit bay yourself clipping it. You're working with someone and you're selecting the shots, put this here, put that there, that type of thing. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm the producer. I've got an editor in front of me. He runs the equipment and we both kind of talk and come up with things we think look pretty cool. Right. And they had some good editors back then, man. They were tremendous, talented guys. And I love when they would say, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? And then, you know, I would come up with some ideas about uh, doing some wraparounds uh, on camera for video cassette. There's one that I've seen on social media where uh, Sean Mooney is talking to Brother Love and Brother Love comes out and hits him in the face with a cake. And I come out and laugh at Sean Mooney. I set up that whole thing. I, I set up Sean Mooney going around to everybody and trying to get interviews that day. And we put it in the video cassette and made it something uh, something very entertaining. Uh, they let me go out and do site surveys on places. Went to San Diego one time when the, we were out in San Diego, did a site survey and had Gene Okerlund do this thing with the, uh, with the bushwhackers. And we set this up. So we did a lot of really cool thing, video things to make it a little bit different than just showing tape after tape after tape, you know, ins and outs, things like that. I was very proud of my work. I really, really was. Um, you talked a little bit about the people that you worked with there in the office and how, how much you enjoyed working with so many of them and how talented some were. Is there anybody that you didn't get along with there in the office? Uh, no. No, not, not really. There was one editor, uh, and he edited with Kevin Dunn. I can't even remember his name. His name's Kevin. I think he's still there. And he and I... Uh, had some smart ass words between us at one time, but no, I liked everybody there. Everybody really got along and it was important for everybody to get along. Uh, who do you think you got along with the best of that crew of, of everybody? Uh, well, Lord Alfred Hayes, uh, yeah. Tommy Carlucci. I don't think, uh, enough people talk about Lord Alfred Hayes. Do you have any good Lord Alfred Hayes stories or memories you could share with us? Well, yeah, Lord Alfred Hayes and I, and this was once again a, a, a byproduct of doing Coliseum videos. Lord Alfred Hayes and I went to London, Brussels, and Paris on a trip, my first trip ever out of the country. Uh, and we did play-by-play -play on, I guess, Sky Vision for a w, uh, WWF event at the uh, London Arena. And then we traveled around London and we got we hired cameramen, local cameramen, to come around and shoot Alfred doing the ins and outs of, you know, we did a video cassette of the WWE in London, WWE in Brussels, WWE in Paris, uh, and we went around all these different places and and shot uh, video for, and I had I had the it was one of the greatest trips of my life. We went to London, we were on our own after the event. We drove from London down to the White Cliffs of Dover. And we had a rental car, and I drove the, you know, on the wrong side of the road, uh, as they do in England. And we took a jet foil across the uh, English Channel from the White Cliffs of Dover to Ostend, a train from Ostend to uh, Brussels. Spent the night in Brussels, and that's where they had the famous fight with Coco Beware uh, and Jim Troy and breaking of the liquor bottle and everybody getting fired. And then we went to Paris. Didn't have to go to the show in Paris. Didn't have to go to the show in Brussels, but we did. We took a, a couple of days to shoot in Paris. And I spent the, like a whole week with Lord Alfred Hayes. And I realized how not only how great of a talent he was. I remember how great of a talent he was as a manager uh, back when I was watching wrestling. But how great of a nice of a person he was. Just a great, great man. And... Uh, he all he often told me about you know wrestlers that he didn't like and didn't uh, think they were good people and he always said he said he would always tell me when he would say oh I don't like him he would always say you do trust my judgment don't you I said oh yeah he said I would never lie to you uh, 
And if you trust my judgment, know that what I tell you about this person is true. And uh, we became very, very good friends. And then, of course, he moved on and he came to WCW and they interviewed him. He did get a job and went to Dallas and lived with his, uh, his daughter, I guess, and then passed away. And I found out like five years later he had passed away, which broke my heart. And that's, a, well, again, I, we're going off on the tangent here, but that's Tony Schiavone not staying up with his friends, which has always been a downfall of mine. Why don't you think WCW had an interest in Lord Alfred Hayes? And why do you think Vince let him go? Um, I know that Lord Alfred quit because they cut his money, but it right. feels like Vince, if he really wanted to, could have found a way to keep him together, keep, it, yeah. keep the band together. It's always been a sore point with me. I always thought Vince should have taken care of Lord Alfred Hayes because Lord Alfred Hayes did everything. And, uh, we did some shows together. You know, he was uh, Vince's uh, right hand man, Ed McMahon on, on uh, TNT, if you'll recall. Sure. And, uh, was just a good person and why he didn't take care of him, why he let him go. I'll have no idea. I, 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 I don't know. And it's, it's one of the things that I wish I knew more about it. And I wish I, that's, I have nothing but good things to say about Vince McMahon's treatment of me and my family and Linda's treatment of me and my family when we were there. And I have no ill will to say about Vince McMahon with the exception of from my vantage point, I don't think he treated Lord Alfred Hayes correctly. I don't. Do you feel like anybody there treated you differently because you were the Southern wrestling guy? No. They may have behind my back. And, uh, you know, I found a, uh, talking with Bruce and, and all that stuff that, uh, that I, uh, that there was a Southern twang to my voice that Vince didn't like. Vince never told me himself, never. But, uh, I don't think anybody approached me as the Southern wrestling guy. Well, let's talk about that. You brought it up. There's been rumor and innuendo out there that Vince wanted you to take speech classes. Uh, set the record straight. Did you take any sort of classes to get rid of your accent? I did not. I never was approached by anyone about that. Now, that could have been in the works uh, before I left, and I was I was unaware of it. But no one came to me about speech classes. Had they, I would have loved it. Would have absolutely loved it. I uh, I worked hard on getting rid of my southern accent uh, because. My southern accent when I left the mountains of Virginia back in the uh, late 70s was really deep dyed in the wool type Huntsville, Alabama type bullshit. Uh, so I, uh, I had a very southern twang and I, and I worked hard on getting rid of it to the point to where I thought I pretty much had gotten rid of it. But apparently I had not enough to please Vince. So if they had said, we want you to take speech class, I would have jumped at that. Absolutely. I would have loved it. But I never did. <clears throat> you, um, since you mentioned the Bruce thing, there, there's been, you know, Bruce even talked about this, that the perception from Bill Watts and others about New York was that it was, the territory was filled with homosexuals and they would yep. say rude things about Bruce. Uh, whenever he made his way up there, they said, Oh, by this point, Bruce probably already has blah, 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 blah. When you walk into Vince's living room and you're there with Terry Garvin and Pat Patterson, did any of those silly rumors cross your mind? What was the take in the wrestling business from your standpoint at that time, given the circumstance? Well, I had known about uh, Pat Patterson. I didn't even know who Terry Garvin was. Right. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that, that I didn't, uh, Terry was, uh, Terry was married at the time, uh, Lois and his wife became very good friends. Uh, they sold us a couple of Cocker Spaniel puppies. Um, that has nothing to do with, I know what you're talking about, but there was nothing to me, uh, that, that said that smacked of these guys are homosexuals. I, I can tell you of two instances one, we were in Chattanooga, 
And we, I always rode together. If we would go from one town to another between television tapings, you know, between back then Superstars and Challenge, uh, I would always, uh, there would be the driver, I think his name was Jim, uh, and there would be me, Vince, Pat, Bruce, Kevin Dunn. A lot of times Jim would get like a, you know, real nice minivan or something like that. We'd all ride. Uh, and we all got along and joked around. Terry Garvin was with us sometimes and joked around. And there was one time that Pat was in a in a very, very playful mood. And we were in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Pat said a couple of things to me that were homosexual uh, innuendos. Maybe it was a pass or it was a just joking it wasn't around. A, it, wasn't, it, was, it was him being funny and cutting up, but it sure. could have been misconstrued. And I remember this, and this is true. Vince said, I want to talk to you. And Vince said, we all travel together. Pat tries to be funny. You do know that he's just cutting up with you. And I said, sure. Of course I do, Vince. Uh, And he said, however, if you're uncomfortable with how he's talking and what he's saying, I will stop it right now. And I said, no, I'm fine. I'm Because I'm not an uptight person. I'm not. You knew it was a joke. I knew it was a joke, Yeah. but Vince took the time to come to me and tell me that if he thought I, uh, I would, I, if I thought that Pat was being offensive, that he would make Pat stop. So, uh, nothing happened. Uh, then there was another time where, uh, we were all getting ready to go somewhere and, uh, we were, I think we we're getting ready to go to the building and, uh, they, we were at a hotel and the hotel had doors on the outside and in the upper deck or on the balcony up there, Terry Garvin said, uh, Vince was saying, where's Garvin? And, and Garvin opened his door and ran out. He said, I'll be right there. And Vince went, oh, my God, the way you ran out, I thought you were going to come out here naked the way you ran out to shock us. Well, Garvin went back inside, took all his clothes off, and <laughs> ran out on the balcony, and everybody laughed. And he ran back in and got his clothes. And that's, that's all it was. It was fun. It was a joke to us. We were playing around, and, and no one was – no one was uptight about it. So, did it shock you a few years later when the accusations started to come out? Uh, what accusations were those? The the ring boy scandal, the sex scandal. I mean, I can't believe I had to say that. Yeah. Uh, did it shock me? Uh, yeah, it shocked me. I, I it shocked me that uh, I don't. Is that saying as much about where we're going as a society? Uh, well, it just feels like, you know, when you're saying that you were there and that the only time there was any sort of, you know, even remotely a statement that could be misconstrued, right. Vince did his best to stamp it out. Yeah. It feels like he had a good handle on it. And so then yeah. for it to come out later, you know, that maybe there was a, a problem or more to it or a situation, was that a shock to you? Yeah, it was. Oh, you know, the, the, listen – and people are going to scoff at this. I know that the whole, the whole steroid scandal kind of shocked me. I, I just, I just thought it was too professionally run a company to get involved in that stuff from my vantage point. Um, did Vince surround himself with kiss asses at the time, in your opinion, like lots of yes, men? because that's been the rap about a lot of guys, including our, our great friend, Bruce Pritchard. But he was just a yes man and a kiss ass. And you have, acknowledge that when you were in WCW, you were very much, yes, sir. To, so, I mean, we're not saying that to bury anybody. You've outed yourself as being a kiss ass. Do you think Vince had a, a band of merry men doing the same for him here? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, Vince all, uh, many times asked me my opinion on things and he very much wanted to know what I thought. Um, kiss ass. Uh, we were working for a guy who knew how to do TV better than anybody else. And uh, had I been in TV meetings where we would format TV, maybe I would have a better handle on that. Uh, But I I think all of us, Kevin Dunn, Bruce Pritchard, Pat, Terry Garvin, uh, I think we all really enjoyed Vince and respected his opinion. If that's being a yes man, then yes, we were all yes men. Uh, who was the biggest kiss ass of the bunch in your opinion? <laughs> Bruce Pritchard was. I was hoping you were going to say that. Thank you. What, what was the worst example of, uh, Bruce being a kiss <laughs> ass that you can remember? 
I, I, I don't know. Bruce was just like anybody else. Okay. Bruce was a real dick to work for. Uh, and, uh, he's admitted that, give me, give uh, me an we, example of, of how he was being difficult. Okay. Uh, just, uh, that sometimes that he would be in his office and they would work on something that they be in production would work on something like Kevin Dunn, who was in charge of edit three or edit one would work on something. And Bruce wasn't down there in the edit session to watch what was going on. But as the, when they would make it and show Bruce, Bruce would say, Oh, Vince wouldn't like that. Well, I know that pissed a lot of people off because they would, they wanted to, well, Bruce, come on down with us. And while we're putting, Right. Yeah. yeah. And quit uh, shutting your ass up in the office and save us some time. And that, uh, I heard that happened a lot. Uh, Bruce was always kind of a serious guy. Uh, but, and, and I jokingly say that he was an asshole to work with. He, he was difficult to work with. He really was. But in his defense, he was a conduit between Vince and TV writers and production. It wasn't an easy job. It couldn't have been an easy job. Um, so, so Bruce is kind of running production at the time. Did, did you ever <laughs> attend any television production meetings? Only the ones that we had, of course, right before TV in the arenas. Uh, and, and put it this way, this is, this is not a knock on Bruce. Bruce was in charge of TV production and I'm not so sure how much of a TV background Bruce had. Right. Chat me that, up about, uh, a, a television production meeting at an arena. What, what might that feel like or how might that be structured uh there would be a table up front with vince in the center uh and bruce pritchard up there and kevin dunn up there and all the uh the big wigs up there pat up there terry garvin uh and we would all you know we would all have tables to sit around it was it was everybody all the producers and and all the agents and no talent uh and office personnel who were there and vince would run over the show uh, and it would, the show would be complete, uh, and he would he would not divulge into any angles that were going to be done. But he would say, you know, there's something that's going to happen during this match, and we will get back with the people who need to know. And then he would break the meeting. He would always say, uh, "Okay, uh, that's it for today. Uh, I want the agents to stay behind." And then the agents and Vince got together. And came up with what they thought they should do in every match leading to the, the angles. And that would be the longer meeting. And then the agents would get together with the boys. Or and they, they would get together with like Kevin Dunn or Kerwin Silfies, who was the director, let them know what was going to happen, what to look out for. Uh, we would go out and we would do our interviews. We had English 1 and English 2 pre-tapes. We had international pre-tape rooms. They would either uh, put these, uh, what I called them, sonic boards. or uh, They would put these boards up and... Uh, in the rooms to soundproof it, or they would build rooms. Uh, and each agent had his own uh, room that he was in charge of. I remember it, always in charge of one room was Jack Lanza, and he was really always in charge of the main room, of uh, the main interviews that were going to air on the show that day. Uh, uh, who else was in charge of a room? Uh, George the Animal Steel was in charge of the room, a room uh, back when I was there. Nick Bockwinkle, and uh, it was a very well-run day. It, it really was. It, it was a very well-run day. Com contrast that with the way a live event would have been handled by Jim Crockett Promotions. Well, there were no pre-tape interviews for Jim Crockett Promotions. Again, uh, th there, were, there was really no uh, meeting. You were just kind of handed a format, uh, and we did everything live to tape. And every interview that we did was done out there. Uh, so that's funny. David Crockett's calling me now. Uh, we should answer it right now on the podcast. It's like a, it's better than a lowest run in. It's a David Crockett run in. Uh, I clicked that. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, uh, and it was, uh, it was just different. It was, it was, wasn't as big and it wasn't as well produced. I know there was a guy named Nelson Swegler. Mm hmm. Nelson is, uh, I understand, going to work with us on MLW One Shot. Nelson is uh, the mentor for Court Bauer. So 
Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Nelson, 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 a super intelligent guy. I always thought Nelson was was his intelligent level was way above pro wrestling. Uh, but uh, Nelson uh, would always tell me, he said, "Boy, that we, if anybody overproduces stuff, it's us." And it was, it was overproduced. We had a lot of people and a lot of things that we did, but we were the big time, man. We were the absolute big time. Talk to me about um, Vince McMahon. It, w- yeah. You just named a lot of guys who were involved in the meetings and producing the shows and working in the office. Did you ever see anybody stand up to Vince? No. Wow. Okay. I don't. So I don't think so. I don't. I don't know what would standing up to Vince be. Well, I guess you know if he says, "Hey, here's the direction we should go. Uh, here's what we're doing tonight." Does anybody say, "No, nah, Vince, that's a terrible idea. We should do it like this." Probably, I, I would think that there were probably some guys. Uh, I would think so. In but you, you just uh, never the saw agents, it. The, the agents meeting that would do that, right? Well, I mean, in my head, but this is also a guy who we've heard. You know, I, I had a person I know once tell me that in a private conversation they said, "You know, Vince, you really shouldn't talk to me like that in front of the other guys because then they won't respect me," and. Vince just fucking flipped out. It's like, fuck them and fuck you too. And yeah. it was just a critique about the way something was handled that could yeah. have been handled differently. But this is also a guy who we've heard, you know, would get furious if someone was sick or if he himself sneezed. And so there's all these little like kind of Vince isms that we fans have heard. And I was just curious if you ever saw no. a Vince McMahon meltdown. Did you ever see a Vince McMahon shouting match or him go, you know, ape shit on somebody. I never did. I never did. But there was one time, uh, that I saw just a glimpse of a side of him that I've heard about. Uh, and he said, because if I had a Coliseum video to promote, I had to get the inter- I had to get the information to either Bruce or Kevin or somebody so that Vince would have it during the meeting. And he would say, in segment three, we're going to have the genius wrestle Conrad Thompson. And he said, we're going to come out with a reveal, which was kind of a fly-in reveal of the, of the cover of the new Coliseum video about the genius. And I remember one time saying, uh, Vince, this was in the meeting. Uh, I said, uh, they have a T-shirt or a, they would have what they call a special item. Right. That they shrink wrap in there, like maybe a T-shirt or, I don't know, some gimmick that they thought was a big deal. And they wanted us to promote it. And I remember saying, Vince, they got it shrink wrapped in the shirt they wanted us to, just, to talk about. And Vince looked at me and he said, fuck that. That doesn't mean shit. That doesn't sell shit. Wrestling sells it, not, not what they're going to put in the box. I went, yes, sir. And I, you could, he was, it just rubbed him the wrong way. It really did. One time there was a, uh, we had the WrestleMania five video cassette, Hulk Hogan against the Macho Man, Randy Savage, superpowers collide. If I do that by memory yep. and, uh, they came up with the artwork. I showed the artwork to Bruce. Bruce took the artwork to Vince. He said, Vince fucking flipped out. He said, Hulk Hogan needs to look bigger than anybody else on his box. I said, okay, we'll change it. And then there was one time where Vince looked at a, a piece of, I had the, we had the rockers on the cover of a, on a Coliseum video. And Vince told me, he said, it doesn't sell shit. That doesn't make me want to buy shit. And I said, okay. But he never did, I mean, he was forceful, but he never did like scream or flip out towards me at all. So, and I do remember some of the big pay-per-views uh, where I was not doing the play-by-play where he would come to me and he says, are you getting what you need for Coliseum Video? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, good. And he always seemed to care about that. So, Did you ever go to dinner with Vince? I never did. Uh, ever ride in a car with Vince? Oh, yeah, a lot of times, between towns. Was Vince driving? No. Uh, uh, Bruce has told a hilarious story about Vince being the world's craziest driver, and I was right. just curious. Right. No, he had uh, who, uh, Jim Stewart. Jim Stewart, there's his name, was, and that was, uh, Jim Stewart was in a famous legal battle with Vince uh, that I kind of got drawn into. 
Uh, and uh, Jim always drove us around. Uh, who was your traveling partner when you weren't with Vince? When I went with Vince? When you weren't with Vince. When I weren't with Vince? Uh, Kevin Granith. Uh, Lord Alfred Hayes. What did Kevin Granith do? He was uh, one of the producers. Okay. Uh, Kevin all Kevin had worked with Howard Cosell and his mother had been in one of the, uh, had been a, an actor in one of the, uh, soap operas. He was very much entrenched in, in New York city in that area, but was, man, was a great kid. Absolute great kid. Uh, when you were on the road, did you room with anybody or did you get your own room? Got my own room. Would the WWE cover your, uh, travel expenses, like your airfare, your hotel, your rental cars, all that, or where do they draw yep. the line? No, they, they covered everything. Sometimes I travel with Howard Finkel too, a couple of times. How much porn did you watch with Howard? <laughs> None. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, how did the, uh, the travel situation work? You just come back, get your receipts and submit them and they cut you a check. Yep. That was it. Ben, uh, Benny Gonzalez was uh, the, uh, was the guy. How, uh, how brutal was the travel for you? The guys back then, all the boys say it was brutal, but as an announcer, you probably didn't have to make as many towns, right? No, we just made, uh, we just made once a month. Uh, you know, we do four weeks of TV, right? Right. Uh, we do uh, superstars next week, do challenge and then do a pay-per-view, uh, four pay-per-views a year. So it wasn't bad at all. Any memories of working uh, with NBC for a Saturday night's main event or a main event or something like that? Oh yeah. I, I really, really like working with Dick Ebersol. Uh, and Dick was very complimentary of my work. Uh, and I got to know Dick very, very well. I, uh, when we left WrestleMania five, uh, again, I mentioned earlier that when you were doing the video cassettes and you had to do a video cassette of a pay-per-view, you had to turn that around immediately. So me, Kevin Dunn, Kerwin selfies and Dick Ebersol were going to get in a limousine right after WrestleMania five, uh, at Atlantic city and go to the airport and fly to New York where Dick was going to go home and all the rest of us were going to go back to Connecticut. I was going to go back immediately and go into edit three and edit down the pay-per-view, which I ended up doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I stayed overnight uh, into the, all the next day and into the next night editing with my tuck still on and my makeup still on. True story. WrestleMania 5. Uh, as a producer and there was a couch there and I was, I was kind of half out of it some of the time, but the, the plane never made it. We went to the airport in Atlantic city and there was no airplane. So Dick told the limousine driver, you got to drive us to New York city. And the limousine, limousine driver said, I'm not going to. And he got into a big argument with Dick and Dick forced him to drive us. So that in that three hour trip, I got to know Dick Ebersol very, very well. I thought some of the people that worked with him were kind of like big shots. They thought they were bigger than wrestling. Right. You know, he had a crew work with him, but Dick was a pretty down earth guy. And, uh, he and I, uh, I, uh, I called Dick Ebersol after I came back to WCW and after I realized I had made a terrible mistake and, uh, asked Dick to help me out. And Dick said he didn't know if he could do anything for me, but he would see what he could do, but nothing ever happened to that. So, um, guys who spent a lot of time in the WWE talk a lot about catering. Did they have catering back then? What was that like? Yeah. That was pretty good food. I mean, they, they fed the guys during the day and, uh, it was, uh, it was your general catering in the backstage area. And it's kind of where all the guys hung out, you know, it was kind of a central place for guys to hang out. You know, you, you were expected as a WWF guy to get there early. That's why they fed you and get ready to perform. In other words, they wanted you in your gimmick and ready to go. So you could do interviews in English one, English two international, because it was a busy day backstage to do things. Uh, that's where I got to really appreciate the macho man, Randy Savage, because he always got there early. He got dressed up in his macho man gimmick and he was always ready to go. They never had to look for him. He was always ready to go. Uh, so it was kind of a central area where the boys would eat and it was pretty good food. And I remember Kevin Granith and I, one time we said, we're not going to eat this stuff. Uh, we would go out, 
uh, take a rental car, go out and go to a store and get uh, and get like uh, tuna and crackers and stuff like that. And I ended up losing like 60 pounds uh, that year when I worked for the WWE. Was on a diet. Um, how did how did the the catering and Jim Crockett work by comparison? There was no catering in Jim Crockett. If you had it to do over again, would you have preferred to work more in the office or commentary? Like, which did you prefer? Was there one you preferred more over the other, like the production side or the actual yeah. live event commentary stuff? Well, I, I I preferred being a producer. Always have. But you make your money by being a commentator. Sure. So, what was kind of uh, tough choice. Who are your favorite wrestlers to work with when you were you know, at the live events and working with, with some of the boys, did you have any favorites or least favorites to work with? I don't have any. So again, I talk about the macho man, Randy Savage, and I talk about working with him and, uh, the respect I had for him. I enjoyed working with Hogan because Hogan was, Hulk Hogan was bigger than life. Sure. He was bigger than life to everybody that worked in the front office there because he was the big star. Uh, I know Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake, your friend, uh, wasn't, wasn't that friendly, but he wasn't, wasn't mean. Uh, the, uh, ultimate warrior, uh, wasn't that friendly, but he wasn't mean. I remember, uh, walking in my first television and I think my first television may be at, in Hershey, Pennsylvania or Binghamton, New York. Boy, these memories are coming back to me. And I walked in, I said hello to some of the guys who I had known, uh, and, like Arn and Tully, right? Right. And uh, Cowboy Ron Bass. And I remember Cowboy Ron Bass came up to me later in the day, and he said, listen, do me a favor. Go introduce yourself to Andre. I said, okay. I said, you know, I was kind of intimidated because he is Andre the Giant. Right. He said, yeah, but, you know, he, he wants, it's just important that you go introduce yourself to him. I said, okay. I said, Tony Schiavone went, Andre, big hand wrapped around my hand, and, and that was, Really, the only communication I had with Andre. Um, got to know Bobby Heenan very well. Obviously, we did you know did some things and got to know Gorilla Monsoon, uh, one of the greatest men ever, Gorilla Monsoon. Any so, good any uh, good Gorilla stories you can share with us? I don't. I did, with the exception of you know he and Heenan, what you saw on TV, that kind of was real life. They would nag and and I remember uh, Gorilla was uh, a big high roller in Vegas. I don't know if that's well known or not. And when he would go to Vegas, he would have like a big money roll of cash. And I remember Heenan said to him one time when we were, I get, we were at the blackjack table or something. Heenan says, what the hell do you carry all that money with you for? And gorilla says, well, I may want to buy something. And Heenan would say, what are you looking to buy a fucking house? So it was like a gigantic stack and he knew all the, like all the, uh, the big wigs at, uh, Caesar's palace. We were at Caesar's palace one time and he had one of these guys made sure I had my room. Uh, and, uh, just, uh, just a gentleman, absolute gentleman. You know, obviously and, every- and, he, and he took care of me as far as, you know, they brought me in and I did challenge. They, they moved Bobby Heenan off challenge because they were going to give him his own show. And they had me work with gorilla and all of a sudden, Gorilla was kind of pushed into a, a color role, and I was a play-by-play guy, and he always helped me out about saying things that he thought were should be said the right way and the way that Vince would want it being said. He was a great mentor to me in the in the short time I worked there. Uh, anything you can add to Bobby Heenan? Of course, we've talked about Bobby a lot on this show, but... Obviously, he's at the the top of everybody's mind right now. Any good WWF memories of working with Bobby? Yeah, just uh, a lot of times we we had a lot of fun. Uh, Lord Alfred and I were in the audio booth during prime time, uh, and we would voice over matches, and they would go back to uh, Bobby Heenan and uh, Gorilla Monsoon, and we we would cut up back and forth. And I did say one time to uh, to Lord Alfred Hayes, I think about this moment often. I said to Lord Alfred Hayes during a uh, during a downtime, I said, Alfred, do you think my voice sounds nasally? He went, no, I don't. I said, are you sure? Because it sounds nasally to me. He said, no, I don't think at all. So three, two, one, they go to Bobby, and they go to Gorilla, and both are holding their nose. I love it. And Gorilla says, 
So, Brandy, you think uh, Shivani sounds nasally? <laughs> I wish we had that on there. And Heenan says, yes, I think that son of a bitch sounds nasally. It was just, it was just tremendous. It was, so we had a lot of fun with him. Uh, I got to know him the first WrestleMania that I worked with, WrestleMania five. And, you know, Bobby, Bobby wasn't there all the time. So only the big events. And when he came in to do uh prime time, obviously WrestleMania, you know, is obviously an institution now, but it was a big deal. Even back then, you know, WrestleMania was a big deal and WrestleMania three was huge. And now you're here at WrestleMania five. And it's doing the biggest business of all as far as pay-per-view, as pay-per-view capability has expanded. This is probably the biggest show in your history of all sports and entertainment, right? What did it mean to be at WrestleMania 5 for you? Well, I was pretty pumped up about it. I was was excited being involved in it. I had never been to Atlantic City before, uh, and I'd never been to an event that was, uh, had so many fans around it. Uh, and I was, and I've said before, I don't, I don't think I've ever been nervous about doing anything, but I was, I was kind of intimidated by doing the things that I did for WrestleMania. Um, uh, they had me do a thing at the door of the macho man, Randy Savage, where I wanted to get into an inter- interview with him and Vince was producing it. And Vince asked me to, told me what he wanted me to say. And I tried it. He said, let's do it again. And I tried it. And Vince kind of said, okay, that'll, that'll work. And I knew he didn't like the work. Right. And if I go back and I look at it again, I can see why. Because I was kind of a straight man announcer, and he wanted me to be a little bit more, I don't know, a little bit more acting to me. And then he wanted me to kind of set the stage. And I did it a little set the stage in the backstage area. He didn't like it either. He said, okay, that'll work. And I knew he didn't like it. So I remember feeling very intimidated back then working with him as a, my producer. Uh, and uh, that's some of the things I remember about there. But I do remember being just very, very excited about being there. Did you uh, did you have an opportunity to meet Donald Trump at that show? No, not at all. Um, what was your favorite angle that happened while you were there? Of course, you're a wrestling fan, and that seems kind of silly to talk about. But as a wrestling fan who grew up in Mid-Atlantic, this is probably not your ideal presentation there's some, still some good stuff going on here. What did you enjoy the most as far as an angle while you were there? Well, I think the, the angle with Hogan and uh, the Ultimate Warrior was the biggest angle that I was a part of because I don't, think we, I don't think we saw that coming. I remember being Vince had a off from his office had a boardroom. And uh, I was in there. I don't know what I was doing in there. I guess uh, – I think the Coliseum video people wanted to meet with Vince and I was in there and the Coliseum video said video people. And this was like before the first of the year said something about, uh, where something about WrestleMania six. And Vince said, we got plans to make it our biggest WrestleMania yet with a big angle. Right. And of course the big angle was Hogan and ultimate warrior. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a big fucking deal. So that was the biggest angle. I think the one I enjoyed the most because I was kind of part of it, you know, with the Royal Rumble. Yeah, I, I want to talk about Rumble, but before I do, you know, everybody's got an opinion about Warrior. Did you have an opportunity to interact much with him? What was your experience like working with Warrior? He was very didn't have much to say. He was a pretty good guy. Uh, I had a, a lot of uh, negative thoughts about him later on because of what happened with he and a girl named Leisha Murphy. Uh, who worked for me as my assistant. Uh, but during that run, uh, he just would always smile and say hello, but no, no conversations at all. No friendly conversations like I had with Hogan, like I had with Macho Man, like I had with, you know, guys that I knew. Um, what was the hokiest angle that you remember? Of course, at the time, there's lots of silly gimmicks in the WWF, and it's a totally different presentation than the one you grew up on. Uh, do you remember there being one thing in particular where you just kind of wanted to roll your eyes and say, what the fuck are we doing? I know I, I never want to roll my eyes and say what the fuck we were doing, but I always thought, and you know, I love Lanny Poffo, good guy, but I always thought that genius shit was kind of way out there. Sure. And of course the, you know, the red rooster, you know, he can go fuck himself. Did you, um, 
Did you see any wrestler there that you felt like the WWF kind of dropped the ball with? You mentioned Terry Taylor. Do you think they dropped the ball with him or any other? Or do you think that that was kind of still on the talent and the way it shook out was the way it was supposed to be? Yeah, I think it's the way it's supposed to be. I, I don't, I can't, I can't look at a guy and say, man, he should have gotten a better push because the big boss man was there and he certainly got a big push on top. Uh, dusty came aboard and with the exception of the polka dots, which I thought were sillier and shit, uh, because of, you know, uh, because of, of what I've known from dusty in the past, I thought it was silly, but I thought, uh, I always thought the talent uh, relations department and television did a good job of pushing talent. They, they did something there that we never could capture uh, at WCW uh, after that. We did capture it a little bit after when, uh, when Vince Russo came aboard. And that was every time, they, if there was a match at a pay-per-view, every match meant something. Right. Every match had an angle. They weren't just matches to be fillers. And a lot of times we had matches to be fillers at WCW on a pay-per-view. There were no filler matches. As small as the match may have been, the first card on the pay-per-view, it had an angle tied to it that we had something to talk about that had a reason for that match. They still do that today. Um, a lot of your old friends or coworkers from Crockett are there when you get there or, or come in while you're there. You've got Dusty Rhodes, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, uh, the big boss man, Akeem, the powers of pain, Ronnie Garvin. Do you remember any of them feeling like, Hey, we're in New York. We made it and having such a conversation. And conversely, do you remember some of the guys saying, boy, this shit is not what I thought it was. No, I remember the feeling with all of us was, boy, we're glad we escaped Turner Broadcasting. Right. I, I think that was pretty much the feeling of, of all of us. And, and, of course, I knew Arn and Tully very well. I knew Ronnie Garvin very well. Big boss man on you. Uh, and we all kind of felt like that our careers were going the right way, that we had left, uh, you know, because things were very bad with Crockett Promotions financially at the end, and now they were being transformed into this company uh, that had no idea what in the world to fucking do with wrestling. So we all kind of felt like, well, you know, we made the right jump. We're still in wrestling. Did you, um, did you ever suggest anybody from Turner or the old Crockett promotion as a potential hire? No. I'm sure that, you know, when you're doing this, um, you know, and you're, you're making towns on some of the trips with, with guys that you consider friends from the office and then your old coworkers. You probably saw some ribs. Do you remember any ribs that you could tell us about? Uh, as far as the boys are concerned, no, I, I really don't. I, I, uh, I saw a lot more ribs in the old Crockett days uh, than I saw uh, than I saw with... Uh, with Vince McMahon, uh, again, I was, you know, I traveled with Vince and I traveled with his entourage. So it was kind of different. Uh, I didn't hang out with the boys back then. So I can't think of any ribs that I saw. I mean, it was well known that, that Bobby Heenan would play ribs on guys, do crazy stuff. Uh, and it was very well known that Kurt Hennig was, Mr. Perfect was a ribber. But I never did see any of those things full force or in front of me. We've often talked about here on the show that one of your favorite memories was your time that you worked Madison square garden right. and that that match that you still remember being, you know, one of your favorites, if not your very favorite to call was a cage match between Hulk Hogan and big boss man. Tell us, you know, what, what is it like for, you know, a Southern boy now to be kind of in the spotlight in Madison square garden, the biggest arena in the world, the most famous arena in the world. Was that a really, really big deal to you? Or, you know, what was that to you at that moment in your career? Well, I think Conrad, I think the, it's more like what the day meant to me than what the event meant to me. Uh, right. Obviously working in Madison square garden and you know, the fans were really big into Hulkamania back then. And we worked an afternoon show on the MSG network and they did the superplex off of the uh, top of the steel cage. 
and the fans erupted, and just the feeling and the electricity uh, in the arena that day. Then we get on a uh, an airplane, not a private plane. We go through LaGuardia and get on one of their commuter planes. I think back then it was TWA commuters or the Trump commuter planes. And we flew to Boston Garden, and we did a show that night on the New England Sports Network. And I got to go to the Boston Garden for the first time. Lord Alfred Hayes and I did both shows afterwards with Nelson Swegler driving us back. And I think Sean Mooney was with us. We all went to an Italian restaurant in Boston, a real nice Italian restaurant. And we drove back uh, to Connecticut after that. Uh, I can't tell you how big that day was in my career to be able to work MSG Network and work the Garden and work MSR Nesson and work the Boston Garden that night. Uh, that was just uh, was was just a, a big deal for me. Uh, and when I think back about it, if I think about the greatest day I've had in wrestling, that's got to be it. Two live events, two live shows, or maybe they weren't live. Maybe they were taped and you know uh, at a later time. But uh, and I remember uh, how much uh, how popular Hulk Hogan was back then. I also remember uh, Hulk Hogan and the Boss Man did the cage at Madison at. Uh, Boston Garden that night, but they didn't do the superplex. Yeah, they only, they only did that at Madison Square Garden, and they did it on Saturday night's main event. Uh, and I also remember Dusty coming. Dusty was on the card, and he came in running in the ring and jumped up on the turnbuckle, like the middle turnbuckle, to acknowledge the crowd, and he slipped and busted his ass. I remember that one, too. Uh, and he just he didn't miss a step. So I, I, I think that yeah, that, that because of the bump off the top cage and, and working Madison Square Garden and being a little southern redneck announcer uh, with obviously a southern draw that I didn't realize I had, I uh, that Madison Square Garden event was big. But more than that, the day was big for me. How big of a deal was it to Ray Trailer to go from kind of being in the background of Jim Crockett Promotions to now – headlining Madison Square Garden in a cage match against the biggest star in the history of the business. Yeah, it was big. I mean, Ray was a country kid, right, from Georgia, uh, southern as he could be, uh, and just an overall good guy. And it wasn't lost on him what he was doing. It was not lost on him what he was doing. Not only that, I've said this before, Ray Trailer was one of the better big men in the business. Sure. One of the better bumpers and was. Uh, a good worker. His stuff looked legit. Uh, so it was a big deal for him, too. There was no question. We we discussed that a lot. I wonder how it was different working with Dusty here, too, because Dusty and Jim Crockett is kind of top banana. And now here in the WWF, he's just one of the boys. Yeah. Was that more difficult for him or you, do you think? It was more difficult for him. Uh, they went... And did some vignettes, you know, the famous Dusty vignettes about riding on the back of a garbage truck. Sure. And being the pizza delivery man and coming in and being the plumber and and getting rid of a stopped-up commode. They went down and did those vignettes, and Bruce can attest to this more than I can. Bruce told me that Dusty wasn't approaching them correctly, that Dusty's ego was taking over, and he wasn't so sure. He wasn't as cooperative as he should be. So they stopped production on those, according to Bruce, from what I remember, and Vince got involved, and Dusty turned his attitude around. So I think it was more difficult for him because he was the top dog at Jim Crockett Promotions. He ran everything. Uh, What Dusty wanted, he got there uh, to be in just another one of the boys with uh, the WWF. Um, Let's talk about some of the other talent because I feel like you know, there's so many big names during this time. And I know you've touched on Hulk Hogan, but Hulk Hogan is probably one of the biggest, and this sounds like a crazy sentence, but Hulk Hogan in the late eighties is one of the biggest stars in, in the entire world. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, there's no question. Um, Hulk Hogan was the face of the business. Hulk Hogan was the face of professional wrestling. Hulk Hogan was on sports illustrated on the cover of sports illustrated, right? Yeah. Back then, that was as big as you could get in sports. Do you remember there being a situation where the celebrity and the fandom was just really overwhelming? Like if you were ever in public with Hulk Hogan and it just became chaos because people recognized who he was? 
No, I, I never remember that because I, I don't think I was in public with him that much. Uh, he was recognized in the airport. I know a lot. Uh, he and I had a chance to sit uh, in first class together uh, going to a town. We had a great conversation. And he even said it when we got up. He said, it was great talking to you. Uh, and uh, But as far as you know, the fandom, I, I, I never saw that because we lived in our own little wrestling world. Sure. Uh, I lived in the wrestling world of superstars and challenge and pay-per-views, and that's kind of only the time that I saw Hogan, or, of course, the exception of when I did MSG or, or Nesson. Uh, did you ever have an opportunity to spend much time with Roddy Piper? I spent more time with Roddy Piper at Jim Crockett Promotions than I did with the WWE. Any, uh, o- any other big stars that you may, or, or, I mean, anybody, I guess, performers that some of our listeners may remember that you have a funny little... Uh, story about um, and again because I was very much an office guy and you know I didn't travel with the boys back then you know I, I really ch- my, my life really changed uh, I was kind of like uh, a guy that traveled with the boys with Jim Crockett promotions to a guy that traveled with Vince uh, I, I really don't I, I really don't have any funny stories that, I mean I can make up some for you no, but, no, no uh, that's fine D- did you meet? I, mean, any- I do remember getting to know, uh, you know, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, uh, the Rockers. I thought they were they were pretty cool guys. Uh, I always knew that Jacques Rougeau had a lot of heat, right? And I think that's well documented. I never saw that, and that was always, and that was even back when they were the the Rougeau brothers, the Jimmy Hart as their manager, right? Uh, and I never saw that, uh, even when Jacques Rougeau came to work for WCW. I can tell you that there are famous stories about Frenchie Martin. I don't know if you've heard any of his stories. He is like apparently one of the greatest rivers of all time. Uh, and Frenchie, uh, apparently, uh, and Heenan used to tell me these stories. Frenchie used to have a Halliburton case. You know, a lot of guys had a Halliburton case. Sure. Uh, and Frenchie used to have a Halliburton case that was filled with dildos and sexual devices. Mm-hmm. And he would have that somehow spring-loaded to where he could walk through the airport and it would come open and the dildos would fly everywhere. <laughs> and he didn't tell me that one time it flew open and dildo slid, slid towards this old lady uh, at a ticket counter. And he said, pardon me, madame, would you pick that up for me? <laughs> and she went, ah, and just screamed. And it was like a you know a long dildo, so he used to do that. He used to also reach for his bag on the carousel, and would fall into the carousel, and then take a couple of laps around like he was trying to get out. You know, hands and feet flailing in the air, going ah! like that, and would do things like that. Uh, one time, and this was when I was at the WWF. For some reason, we were on a flight somewhere. It may have been between towns or on our way to a town, but Heenan was with the group of us, and this. Asian lady took a liking to Bobby Heenan and she kept talking to him. I don't know if she was a fan or she just wanted somebody to talk to. And she said, sir, where are you going to? And he said, we're going to, (laughs) I got to get this right because we all fell out. He said, we're going to Guam. She went, oh, Guam. He said, yes. What are you doing in Guam? We're going to a cornhole convention. (laughs) So everybody broke up and she just smiled and nodded. That's amazing. Yeah. But I, I think Frenchie was a well-known uh, river back then. Did you uh, meet any celebrities while you were working for the WWF? Uh, no, not really. Mm-mm. Do you think that you got recognized more when you were out in public because you were on WWF TV? Uh, no, I don't think so. Did your friends and family back home think it was a bigger deal that you were on WWF TV? No, they did not because they were all my friends and family back home were all into Southern wrestling. The biggest deal for my friends and family was when I first appeared on uh, World Championship Wrestling in 85. That was a big deal to them. Uh, of course, the big, uh, the big shows that everybody remembers you calling there were SummerSlam 89 and Royal Rumble 90. Do you have any specific memories or stories from those two shows you could share with us? Well, I, I remember working with Jesse and being excited about working SummerSlam. And I remember the famous one, and you can still find it, I know, on YouTube, where uh, we pitched to Gene Okerlund with Bobby Heenan and Ravishing Rick Rude, and the SummerSlam sign falls down, 
And Gene Anderson says, ah, fuck it. And that went on the air. Uh, that was a pre-tape that was queued up to the wrong one. And it was queued up to the wrong one by a guy named Rob Wright, who I think I mentioned him before, worked in WCW and was probably every bit as, as incompetent in WCW as he was in the WWE. And he queued up the wrong one. And I remember it coming back to us. And there was a pause. I don't know how long the pause was. And Bruce Pritchard, who was in my ear, Bruce was the one that produced me. Bruce was in my ear and he was talking to me and Jesse. And he said, Jesse, pick it up here. Say something about Gene to make it seem like that was his fault. And he did that on purpose. And Jesse did. Oh, that little ball, blah, blah, blah. I wish I would have fallen on his head and knocked him out or something like that. Uh, that's what I remember about that show more than anything else. Uh, I remember the buildup, too, you know, with uh, uh, Tiny Lister and Zeus and all of that. And I really thought that considering that it was a an angle based on helping trying to promote a movie, No Holes Barred. Right. I think it was I think it was well done. Uh, I think that, uh, and I think a lot of people always uh, tip their cap, uh, cap to Pat Patterson for being able to come up with great finishes. And even having guys who probably couldn't work that well, even giving you a good match. The most famous one being the Hulk Hogan uh, Ultimate Warrior match from WrestleMania Six, which I thought was fantastic. Sure. I thought for two guys who weren't known as the greatest workers in the world, they pulled on a tremendous match and Pat set that up. And now, fast forward to when they were with us in WCW and how shitty that match was. Um, so that was SummerSlam. Uh, Royal Rumble. Uh, all right, there was a time between SummerSlam and Royal Rumble where I apparently fell out of favor. And uh, I, the next event was Survivor Series. There were four each year, right? SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania. I never heard from anybody, and Bruce would be the one to tell me, I never heard from anybody if I was doing the commentary for Survivor Series or not, which was held at the Rosemont Horizon that year. And we just talked about Nelson Swagler. And Nelson, I don't know how it got brought up, and I said, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing at at uh, Survivor Series. And Nelson said, well, Gorilla Monsoon's doing the play-by-play. -play. Everybody knows that. I said, well, Nelson, I don't know it. He said, well, that's what I was told. So I'm thinking, what the fuck? So uh, the next time I saw Bruce, and I don't know, can't remember where that was, Bruce said, yeah, Gorilla's doing it. I thought I told you. He said, you didn't tell me, motherfucker, anything. Uh and so I went, we were at a TV taping and I went to Vince's room uh, and Jim Stewart was there. He was always kind of sit outside there. And I said, is Vince in? He said, yeah, knocked on the door. And I remember Vince was, was looking in the mirror. I, he was either shaving or was looking in the mirror, getting ready to go out. And I said, Vince, just a second. He timed me. He said, sure. I said, I haven't heard, am I doing the Survivor Series or is Gorilla Monsoon? And Vince paused and said, we haven't made that decision yet. I said, okay. I walked out. So I'm thinking, either Vince is bullshitting me or Bruce is bullshitting me. What the fuck's going on here? Well, I kind of let it sit there, and of course, Gorilla ended up doing it. Uh, what, I, what I discovered later was that Vince wanted Bruce to tell me that because that was Bruce's job to tell me that. And Bruce didn't tell me that. He thought he had. Uh, I had often heard that Vince was back then, kind of like his father was back then. Back then, his father was always to tell you the good news. He's the good cop. He's the good cop. And he'd have someone else tell you the bad news. And Bruce was the bad cop. And brought Bruce was the bad cop. So I didn't do Survivor Series. We go to Royal Rumble. I'm not going to do Royal Rumble. It's going to be Vince and Jesse doing Royal Rumble. But that Royal Rumble was in Orlando. And we were at the uh, the O Arena, the Orlando, the old Orlando Arena, and they were had been down. This was on a Sunday. They had been down. I think Bruce was may have been with him. Pat was with him. I was not with him because I had to get to the the event early 
in the day to do my Coliseum video interviews. Uh, they had been down in Boca. I guess Vince had a house down there. Right. Boat. And they had spent the whole weekend there. And what was going to be a noon meeting in Orlando ended up being a three o'clock meeting because they just got there late and they were, had, had such a great weekend in the sun. Vince sat down and he started the meeting and he looked around, he looked at me, he said, Tony, do you have your tux? I said, yes, sir. He said, good. You're doing the play by play. I, I, I don't want I don't, I just don't think I can do it. And so three o'clock that day was when I was told I was doing the play by play of Royal Rumble. So four, I, four hours before the show, yeah, you find out you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, um, to me, it was no big deal. I, you know, I knew all the angles. Uh, I knew everything. And um, what, what did you think you were going to be in line to call WrestleMania six? I don't know. Well, let's talk about how it comes to I, an I, end. I, here. I wasn't thinking about that far ahead. So. Well, that's January of 1990, of course, the Royal Rumble. When do you let Vince know that you want to leave? All right. Uh, I uh, got a call from Jim Barnett. Can't tell you when it was. He called my house. I don't know how he got my number. Day before It was before cell phones, of course. And he said, oh, I'm glad I got you. He said, uh, we'd like for you to come back to WCW. And I said, uh, Jim, I'm not coming back. He said, but, uh, but you need to hear us out first because we're going to offer you some money. I said, all right, I'll call you back. So I talked to Lois, and Lois says, well, you know, you do what you want to do, and we'll follow you anywhere we follow you. But you do realize how tough it is to make ends meet here, and my mom and her elderly parents were back in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. My family was in Virginia. Still is. And uh, she said, do what you want to do. So I called Jim back. I said, okay, I'll meet with you guys. They went, uh, Jim Barnett and Jim Hurd uh, came to the Grand Hyatt in New York. And I kept it quiet because I often thought in my mind, my uh, my mind that is uh, certainly, as you know, very negative at times and uh don't have a lot of confidence at times. My mind, I thought that if Vince found out I was going to talk with him, even talk with him, he'd fire me. So I kept it quiet. Uh, and Jim Hurd said, well, we made a mistake. We want you to come back as an executive producer. You'll be in charge of all of our syndication. What's Vince offering you? What, what is Vince paying you? And I told him. He said, all right, we're going to give you 35000 more a year. The first year, the next year we're going to up it to forty-five thousand more, and the next year you'll maybe making fifty-five thousand more a year than what you're making now. And I know it's more expensive to live up here, blah blah blah. And he also said, and this caught my attention. He said, "You know that we are owned by TBS, which owns the Atlanta Braves, and we know you love baseball. You fulfill the three years of this contract, and we will do all we can to help you get work with the Atlanta Braves." I said, all right, thank you very much. I left thinking in the back of my mind, and I was right. Yeah, that's bullshit. The Atlanta Braves are not going to let a wrestling announcer do their stuff. Um, went back, and Lois and I talked about it, and again, she said, you know, it's do what you want to do. I, I'd rather move back to the south, but wherever you want to live. And I literally, literally got a, a, a yellow legal pad, a long one, and put the pros and the cons, wrote them down, of going back and staying with the WWF. And I'm telling you, it's it's still to this day the most agonizing decision I ever made. And I made it, and I told Bruce, and Bruce, what, what happened before that was, uh, I asked for a big raise. And didn't get a big raise, and I, that's fine. You're not going to, they can only say no, right? Who did you ask a big raise for? You asked Bruce? Bruce, Bruce fucking Pritchard. And Bruce not only didn't give me a big raise, he gave me a very terrible review. It was not a terrible review. I shouldn't say that. It wasn't a good review. 
got to work on this, got to work on that. And I knew I had done great with Coliseum videos. I know I had done great work. Just ask the Coliseum video people. I had put more effort into Coliseum videos than they had ever had before. Effort into it. And that's what made it the, the difference. So it was a bad review. It was just about the same time that, you know, they were, WCW was offering me this. And I got to thinking that, you know, I'm not so sure that uh, they really want me here. So I went to tell Bruce, and Bruce said, you got to be fucking shitting me. He said, all right, I'm going to call Vince. And he called Vince, and Bruce said, Vince is really pissed off. He was sick today. He didn't even come to work, but he's coming in here to the production facility and talk to you. And Vince came in, and he was angry. And one thing I remember Vince saying was, do you think that Turner is going to take care of you and your family like I did or like I have? And I said, no, I don't, to be honest with you. I really don't. I said, but it's a decision I've got to make for my family and not necessarily my career. So he said, all right. And then I went to, when it was all said and done, it was over. This was after WrestleMania six. I go into Vince's office and I signed these waiver releases or whatever he had me sign. And he was great. He was a, a different person. He said, I understand. I understand what you're, what you're going through. He said, I want you to know the door is always open for you to come back here. That's what he said to me. Uh, a week back at WCW, I called back wanting my job back, uh, thinking I made the biggest mistake of my life because I went went back to basically a company that was being run on a production level like Jim Crockett Promotions. And I had come from this great production facility that was organized and well-staffed and well-funded and well-run, and I was going back to a production facility that – uh, Turner had put in that was kind of run just a little step above what was run by Crockett. So I was miserable. And uh, Emily Feinberg took my call. She said, all right, I'll talk to Vince. You can call again. I, I called again and she said, no, Vince said you have a young family. Uh, you moved them from Charlotte to Connecticut. And then a year later from Connecticut to Atlanta, you don't want to drag them back and forth. Stay right where you are. Make it work. And I did. And that's the end of that story. Uh, there was a little issue that that came out of that. Uh, there was Vince had, uh, I don't know, brought up suit or brought up charges or something happened where Jim Stewart, uh, the true story here too, Jim Stewart, who was his uh, driver, was suing Vince. Vince was going to counter sue Jim Stewart and was going to countersue Jim Stewart by telling WCW WWE secrets. He was passing WWE secrets to WCW. And when they looked at Jim Stewart's records that were subpoenaed, there were a lot of Jim Stewart's calls to my house and to me in the office. So uh, Mr. McDivitt deposed me. And Mr. McDivitt basically asked me what this was all about. I said, Jim Stewart had lost his job with Vince and wanted a job. And he and I had been friendly and he called many times asking for a job. And I tried my best to tell Jim, Jim, I, I could go to these people, but they don't have any need for a driver, a limousine driver here. It's a different, it's a completely different situation. Uh, and there's a moment in the deposition, which is a funny moment in the Shivani family, to where uh, uh, Jerry McDivitt says, uh, Mr. Shivani, if you will look on, uh, I've got a copy here of, of uh, Jim Stewart's phone bill. It looks like he called uh, your office and looks like it was only like a two-minute call. Looks like he may have left a message. Is that your office number? Yes, sir, it is. And then he called your house, is this your home number? Yes, sir, it is. And it looks like he talked to someone at your house for 20 minutes. I said, yes, sir. He said, were you home that day? I said, I was not. He said, why in the world, if you have told him that there is no job for him, would he call your house during the day and talk to 20, someone for 20 minutes? I said, well, I, I can tell you why that was. I said, he talked to my wife, Lois. 
He said, why would he talk to Lois for 20 minutes? I said, Mr. McDivitt, there's a phone right behind you there. Pick up that phone right now and call my house. My wife will talk to you for 30 minutes not knowing who the fuck you are. And he smiled and I got a little laugh. And that was the end of my deposition. I don't know that everybody knew that, um, but I'm glad you shared it with us. It was, it was quite the run here. When you look back, what was your biggest thrill in your time working with the WWF that day with Madison square garden and Boston garden, WrestleMania, what stands out the most? Uh, what's the, a couple of things, the, the, the Boston garden and Madison square garden day stands out. Being able to work WrestleMania stands out being able to make friends like I've made. Uh, I don't think it's any secret. I hope it's not a secret that I'm still friends. Although we, we hardly ever get in touch with each other anymore with uh, Tommy Carlucci and his wife, Michelle. Uh, and they have been very, very good friends of ours. I made some very close friends. Uh, that stands out. Um, it was a great, it was a, it was a great year. And it was a year that again, that I, I, I knew I made a mistake looking back on it. You know, things are meant for a reason as they, as Lois likes to say, uh, I wouldn't be able to work with the Georgia Bulldogs like I do. And like I love doing, I wouldn't be able to, uh, work with the, uh, now it's funny. As soon as WCW went down, I started working for the Braves. <laughs> it shows you how much Turner broadcasting fucking knew. Uh, and Hey, Conrad, I would have never met you. Well, never this podcast so i think everybody listening is grateful for that yeah so it all worked out for a reason i had and and it was a it was a lot of fun it really was it was a professionally run organization i know uh you know when lois and i first went to connecticut uh uh jj and his wife then Lindsay and i uh and lois had dinner we toasted you know champagne or wine or beer whatever it was that night to a new life vince uh jj left telling me that Vince was a very unkind man. I never saw that at all. My wife, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my mother, we, we left in, uh, in April, came back in April of 1990. My mother died on the 4th of July of 1990. And we got a leather-bound uh, thing. I think it's not the proper word, but we got a leather bound, this leather-bound thing in the mail from Vince and Linda where they said they were going to say a uh, prayer for my w- mother's soul every day from the Catholic church. Uh, and they sent that to me and I'm a Catholic. So I know those things are not cheap. The Catholics don't do anything for free. So they had to pay a good amount of money. And that meant a lot. That meant a lot. And that just shows me what type of people they were. JJ said he was a very unkind man at times. I don't know if I would have lasted up there. I'm not sure. I'm not so sure the timing was right, but it was a great year. It really was. Do you regret the way you gave notice to Vince? Yep, sure do. Is that your he, thought, he told me, he told me, he said, I thought you were in here for the long haul. I said, yeah, I thought I was too. And when I got up there, I thought I was, but things changed. Let's go to Twitter. We got lots of questions on there. We asked you if you had a question for Tony and we want to do some of these rapid fire. Tony, we're running short on time. We're going to run through them. Are you ready? Ready. Uh, Dave Silva wants to know who was bigger, Parker or Virgil? Dave Silver's waistline. Uh, Justin Hanna wants to know who had a low key big hog in the WWF locker room in 1989. Yeah, I guess it would have been Andre the Giant. Everything is relative, right? Uh, David Bixon's fan wants to know what is Tony's version of what went down with Jeff Carr at TBS and that led to him quitting and going to the WWF. The Jeff le- Carr. The legend le- is that Tony blames the, 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 Steve Beverly because it was Carr that asked Steve who he thought would be the best solo TBS host, and he said Jr. With Tony being the syndication host. Well, okay, I didn't. I, well, I'm sure Beverly said that because Beverly was always so full of shit, the worst of the worst. Uh, but that that wasn't the reason I left WCW. The reason I left WCW was because I didn't want to work there. It wasn't anything Jeff Carr did. Jeff Carr was a fucking idiot. Uh, Tony wants to know, did Lois get one last mustache rod before you had to shave it off? No, no, man. When When you're married, those go out of, those go, those go out of style. Uh, I shaved it off because Vince told me to shave it off. He Uh, said that Gene Oakland had a mustache and he just wanted one announcer with a mustache and I gladly did it. 
RJ wants to know if you could have seen one performer in the WWE uh, when you were there, why was it Tom Zink? Yeah, it was not Tom Zink. It would have been, while I was there, the Nature Boy Ric Flair. Wouldn't that have been cool if he would have came when you were there? You would have had J.J. Dillon in the office, Arn, Tully, Barry Windham was in briefly, Ric yeah. Flair. You could have had a horseman group right then when you were there. It would have been a big deal. Uh, Chris wants to know, what did you think of Demolition compared to the Road Warriors? You know, I, uh, when I first saw Demolition, I thought they were a, uh, I thought they were a cheap imitation of the Road Warriors, but then I saw how fans reacted to them and they had a pretty cool song and, uh, it, it grew on me. It worked on, it worked at first. It didn't, but I thought it was pretty cool. Ian wants to know how was working with Jesse in the WWF compared to later on in WCW. It was uh, Jesse in the WWF was at the top of his game. Jesse and WCW kind of fell out of favor with Eric, so it wasn't as good working with him. Although I did travel with Jesse more in WCW than I did in the WWF. Rodney wants to know, what is something Vince McMahon gets a bad rap for and something he doesn't get enough credit for? Well, I'm not so sure if, if he uh, – I'm not – he. I, it's hard for me to say. Vince McMahon has changed throughout the years. I understand that. Uh, you know, he gets this bad rap of flying off the handle. I never saw that. I know what happens. I never saw that in public. I never saw him dress down somebody in front of everybody else. John wants to know, is it true that Jesse Ventura once told you to relax and follow his lead prior to SummerSlam 89? I don't know if that really happened, but that sounds probably about right. Uh, Tony wants to know, do you regret never being allowed to call a match at WrestleMania? No, not at all. Uh, do you have a good story you could share about riding on private planes with Vince and the crew? Well, we always had food, uh, and we always had like shrimp and something to eat. And I remember, uh, we were flying somewhere. I think we were flying back to Connecticut. And back then, a lot of times we flew out of, uh, White Plains, New York. And it was foggy and it was touch and go. And it was a hard landing and shrimp flew up in the air and all over Vince. And Vince was really pissed and everybody kind of laughed at him and he kind of laughed it off after that. Was there anyone you met during your tenure there that was the WWF equivalent of Klondike Bill? Uh, no. No. There's no equivalent to Conic Bill anywhere in the world. Uh, what was the best advice that you got from Gorilla Monsoon? Gorilla Monsoon told me to be Tony Schiavone. And Gorilla Monsoon and I talked about when I did not was not doing Royal Rumble or Survivor Series. Uh, and I talked to Gorilla about that. And, and it wasn't talking to Gorilla about being upset that he did it, but just kind of questioning why Vince would not want me to do it. And he said, listen, you can only be Tony Schiavone, be the same person you were all those years on TBS. That's who Vince hired. And that's who you are. So don't change that. I remember him telling me that. Uh, this is a fun question here from Greg. Do you have any memories of Shane or Stephanie McMahon? No, they were kids. They were young kids back then. Um, I guess that's it, man. We're going to wrap up this week's episode. We're going to give you next week's poll. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter. He's at Tony Schiavone 24. I am at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. And you can vote for this week's poll right now. All you've got to do is go over to at WHW Monday. Tony, are you ready? I'm ready. We're going to do something fun next week. We're going to encourage you to follow along on the WWE network. And we're going to kick it old school. We're going to give you some alternate commentary and just talk about all the happenings going on in the company. And of course, what you're seeing on the screen. We're picking uh, a pretty interesting era and some interesting moments from about this time of year. Uh, we're going to go to a 1998 Nitro where Hogan and Bret Hart finally have a match. What might we talk about when Hogan Bret finally happens on Nitro? Do you remember this match from 98? Uh, yeah, I can remember uh, the excitement of Bret Hart finally being in WCW. Uh, and I can remember... Uh, it, it's not coincidence. It's really not. But I can remember WCW kind of starting to tick down from there. 
and, and it happens during a you know a, an interesting time in the business. The business is at a peak. Hogan Brett has been the match wrestling fans wanted to see for a long time. They're finally getting it in WCW, and we might cover that next week. That is poll option number one. Uh, it's a 1998 Nitro. Next up, we're going to go to a 1999 Nitro. Here's where we're going to get the Chris Benoit Bret Hart match. It was an Owen Hart tribute match of sorts. One of the better matches of the year. Certainly one of Bret's more iconic matches in WCW. It happened on a 1999 Nitro. What might we talk about if we cover this particular episode, Tony? I think we're going to talk about how how great that match was. And uh, it, it's 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 tough, Conrad, talking about Chris Benoit. It is. Uh, but... I guess we can address him a little bit. So there you go. If you guys were into Bret Hart in WCW, we've got two options for you. Poll option one and two. Poll option three, Vince Russo wins the world title. This happened in 2000. One of the more controversial moments in the history of WCW. Tony, rumor and innuendo out there is that you actually deserve some of the blame for this idea. What might we talk about if we discuss the Nitro where Russo won the belt? Uh, we'll talk about my discussion with Vince Russo about that. Uh, and uh, how much uh, Vince and I discussed things and how actually how close Vince and I were during that time because Vince was and still is a, a friend of mine. Rounding out our Monday Nitro poll, poll option number four is the Nitro from 2000 where they had a San Francisco 49ers match. This sounds ridiculous because it was. It's actually in the WrestleCrap Hall of Fame, I'm sure. We've got Booker T and Jeff Jarrett battling for the belt in a San Francisco 49ers match. What might we talk about if this Nitro from 2000 wins the poll, Tony? Uh, we're going to talk about how crappy that event was and that match was because it was so crappy it has been completely wiped from my memory. Uh, this is something you have got to see to believe. So let's recap quickly. we got Hogan Brett Nitro. It finally happens on a 1998 edition of Nitro. We've got Benoit and Brett for an Owen tribute in a 99 Nitro. So there's two Brett Hart topics if you're into him. Russo winning the world title, obviously one of the more controversial moments in company history. It's a 2000 Nitro. That's poll option number three. And last but certainly not least, the silly San Francisco 49ers match. Jeff Jarrett, Booker T, the belt's hidden in a box on a pole. Who booked this shit? Well, you know the answer. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, but, Tony, when I look at the clock right now, I can't help but realize it's about that time. You're exactly right, Conrad Thompson. It is exactly about that time. And now let's take you to the Shivani living room where Tony Shivani is sitting on the couch. Oh, he's sobbing and crying. He has made the biggest mistake of his life. He's going to get on the phone and talk to Vince McMahon, at least try to talk to Vince McMahon for a third time. Emily, I want to come back. I've made a mistake. Emily Feinberg on the other end says, grow up, you fat son of a bitch, and we'll see you next week on What Happened When Monday on the MLW Radio Network.